and teachers, please rise to welcome Mr. Krishnan Jagannathan with a thunderous round of applause. A very good morning to our honorable guest, Mr. Krishnan Jagannathan, Chairman and Co-Founder of Global Schools Foundation, Mr. Atul Temunekar, Members of Executive Management, Principal GI Smart Campus Pungol, Ms. Melissa Maria, Teachers, Staff and Students. I'm Ashwarya and this is Himadri. We welcome you all to this very special lecture today. The lecture seeks to broaden our global perspectives with regards to the field of the lecturer. Today, we have the honor of hosting Mr. Krishnan Jagannathan, a distinguished business security advisor at IBM. Mr. Jagannathan has served with the governments of Thailand, Indonesia and others in South Asia, formulating their cyber defense strategies to protect national sovereignty. Mr. Jagannathan began his career as a regional security advisor for Hewlett Packard before moving over to senior architect of iPlanet Systems at Sun Microsystems. After a few years as business manager for hosted software services at Microsoft and a brief stint as director at Blue Cloud Computing, he moved over to Tiger Team at IBM. This varied career experience is truly an amazing one, sir. Which is why, sir, today this floor is all yours to broaden our minds with your words of wisdom. Today, students from numerous GIIS campuses all over the world join us for this event and eagerly await the answers to their questions. So without further ado, let us launch ourselves into the question and answer session. We welcome our panelists and request them to introduce themselves. Hey, guys. Um, how familiar are you guys with, uh, how many of you guys fooling around on the internet? Just give me a show of hands, hacking and stuff like that. <laughs> so there are a few, few hands still up there. That's interesting. Um, and what do you do while you think you're hacking? You don't want to talk about it? Or you want to talk about it? Yeah, just speak up. Okay. Stick sports, that's it. It's got nothing to do with hacking. <laughs> All right. So turn it in and stuff like that, right? At about midnight. Yeah, about there. All right, decent, decent folks. So none of you are fooling around. So let's uh, take a look at the folks who basically are fooling around and just give you a you know give an idea as to the as to the origins of the internet perhaps we'll talk about uh, internet governance it's basically a self-governing uh, animal the internet so you have to know about it most of you perhaps may not be in, uh, in uh, connected with internet governance or it's a good time for you to understand that what are governments doing with the internet? Perhaps you, you may be hitting walls, firewalls, while accessing interesting sites. So there's a balkanization of the internet that's happening. It's been broken into smaller you know, pieces, which is, it, was, it was never meant to actually be like that. So let's take a look at that. And then let's take a look at the motivation towards uh, cyber warfare, cyber threats, and so forth. And f what folks like me do for a day job, trying to essentially protect organizations like your school and other you know, commercial organizations and governments against uh, the bad guys, right? So that's what this entire you know, few slides uh, will basically touch upon. Most of them are visuals, so you know, let's jump into it. So the whole idea is basically to get you to understand this uh, space. This is, I mean, so this is going to be on, guys, this one? All right, it's fine. Let's leave it there. This is a submarine cable map which connects the world over which most of the internet traffic essentially travels, about 99% of it, right? Other things travel on it as well, such as uh, calls, such as video and stuff like that. So it's basically a bunch of fiber that's running across. If you guys uh, go down to the uh, 
gardens by the bay how many of you guys go to, go down to the to to the barrage more often than not you will see a cable ship an asean cable ship the guys on that cable ship do a very interesting job highly paid chaps who basically go and fix the cables underwater right so look out for the cable ship there'll be a couple of cable ships there it's important essentially as you can see the cables run under the sea and land at specific internet exchange points for india for example there's one at bombay one at uh, madras um and then of course over land there are many ways of transmitting uh, the connectivity so all your isps connect from these internet exchange points and provide services so you'll also see um singapore there and perhaps you will see the connectivity through uh europe to america and you also see connectivity connectivity under the pacific so this is more or less your uh, channel of communication across the world right if i click on this it's supposed to take me somewhere uh is there internet connectivity here without that i won't actually be able to show you much <laughs> anyway go back to this this website is important guys i mean that's what's important here mm -hmm. where am i going okay come on just note down telegeography okay go to the website there are lots of interesting views you can actually zoom in zoom out uh you can see who's consuming how much bandwidth uh, which cities essentially uh, consume how much bandwidth what's happening on the web at that point in time almost in real time and so forth so telegeography is the is a company that allows you to do that so uh, make a note of that right you can spend some time on this this is this is important this shows you what the internet is all about no news all right let me just connect to my you can yeah i have a hotspot on my phone that should be all. give me give me a couple of minutes guys let me connect this isn't there is in there a wifi here it'll be faster that way how many of you been uh, considering a career in cyber security give me a show of hands have you thought about it just two of you guys indian parents pushing you towards either computer science or becoming a doctor or an accountant just one of you there wonderful god bless you one more there who else all right okay so this is what you will see this is basically um telegeography you can just go down scan you can basically zoom in zoom out whatever it is take a look at the this is africa more or less uh, you won't see much activity here we come towards asia dubai come to india so forth this is this is the connectivity towards europe and then as you move out you can see a whole bunch of connectivity that goes over the pacific right these are the cables that are connecting across the board right if you zoom into this space you'll see things like you know these statistics so you can see stuff stuff like how many guys are connecting to amazon usage all this is interesting spend some time on this even those guys who don't uh, think they'll make a career about uh, out of cyber but you can't run away from the internet right in every walk of life so just take a look at it right it might be interesting so that's the internet let's take a look at the internet from another point of view it started essentially as a very democratic uh medium of communication with the united states government at one point in time it was used actually to connect different spots different locations installations of the government uh it used to be called arpanet at that time so a lot of funds were put into it and there was one guy you know postal who used to run the entire infrastructure um that's how it was as simple as that 
a whole bunch of protocols that were basically used to deliver information over news, over email, SMTP. Uh, news was a news protocol. Network time protocol, you can actually synchronize your uh, websites to an atomic clock over this protocol even today, NTP it's called. And all these things essentially came up. So if you look at the internet, it's broken up into three layers, right? I don't know whether, yeah, it's quite clear, not too bad. And on the right you see a whole bunch of organizations that run the internet. They are not private companies. Basically, a hell, hell of a lot of people coming together to do it. That's basically the ar architecture of the infrastructure layer at the bottom. That's where the connectivity happens, where routers talk to other routers, and so forth. That's the core of the internet, right? And you see a bunch of organizations that are looking at it, such as IEEE, the Internet uh, Engineering Task Force. So there's a whole bunch of protocols, uh, technical uh, means of actually standardizing policies, procedures, and the technicalities of connect connectivity. That's actually done by these organizations here. Above that is the logical layer, right? You see stuff like the root zone, root services, GIIS.edu.sg, right? So the domain is actually broken up as the Singapore domain under which you get a edu domain under which you have GIIS, without which you will go by the IP address. You can't be remembering IP addresses. So there is a way in which you partition the entire namespace. That's actually done by an organization called ICANN IANA, right? ICANN IANA essentially started off to do this, take care, taking care of a protocol called DNS, Domain Name Service. When you actually set up a website, let's hope quite a few of you basically set up your own companies. When you go through that process, you basically give it names you know, basically company names like IBM or whatever it is. And then you'll have a domain such as a .com domain or .org domain if you set up a uh, NGO or something like that. So the entire thing, how is the entire internet namespace partitioned and how does that map to a particular IP address? How many of you guys are not familiar with IP address? Are you all there or have you gone to sleep? Yes, no, show of hands, all familiar with an IP address, right? So that's the end point. So that's taken care of by those organizations. Why this is important for me to let you know is there is so much of voluntary work that's going on here between people who are interested to have this going, right? And there are so many meetings that take place <coughs> and that's how the internet has been run all, all through. Some guys are feeling pretty sleepy, especially in hoods or hoodies. You can actually go to sleep. At the top layer, essentially, is your societal layer. That's where all your services exist, your social networks exist, different industry verticals exist, such as your school. And uh, essentially, you can see that there's a big organization called the IGF. You can look that up on the web, perhaps, later which is the Internet Governance Forum, which takes care of, uh, you know, how the, how the connectivity is actually run and the Internet is run at a, at a worldwide level, which is basically a, a UN and a World Bank uh, run organization, right? So this is how the Internet works. And this is why also you can actually disrupt it. We're coming to that next. This is what countries are doing to the free Internet. What was meant to be free, where you could actually access any information you wanted for the government, against the government, hosted, which is evil, which is good, which is basically just about any information. It was free to flow, whereas now you have country firewalls, like the China firewall. Uh, I'm sure other countries censor the Internet too, and they want to gain more control over it. Now, getting back to an issue, you guys are pretty senior as far as the school is concerned. This is called multi-stakeholder. This is a very important term that you need to remember. The Internet is multi-stakeholder. It's government, it's you, it's the industry, it's many people coming together and deciding how it should be run. Right? Try to understand this. It's actually a beautiful, organic kind of a, uh, a network. 
at various levels. And if you actually break and uh, build walls, you're actually breaking the internet. And it was actually built for the purpose of communication. Once you balkanize the internet, you actually go against that fundamental uh, purpose. And that's what's happening today. So this is something that, you know, there is a big bunch of people who actually are fighting this to make sure the internet remains free. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you're just going to have local area networks. That's it. Right? So we know that this is a free network. Protocols are known to everybody. There is information out there. There's money out there, right? So information and money. Latch on to those two words. Essentially, there are people and there are powers who actually want to go after these two, right? When you gather more information, that is critical information, you actually are in a, power, uh, are in a position to actually do damage. Uh, so it could be secret information about a country. It could be information about the way in which their forces are deployed, the strategic uh, plans of their armies actually to, to mobilize. All this information is sitting when you have a connected internet, right? So you can go after it. So nation states can go after each other's information, critical information, right? They can go after each other, bring down the entire electricity network, which has happened quite a few times, right? So there is critical installations that are connected to the net for the very reason of connectivity, to get business done in good time, that the bad guy can go after, right? Who were these bad guys? They started off with people like you, uh, who could basically go up and say, I've cracked the GIS website or something like that, right? Or, or basically just brag, brag value. Uh, hacktivists, people who hacked into government uh, networks for a reason, saying that, you know, I don't believe in uh, uh, what, I basically I stand for the Dalits or something like that. So people who had an ideology who went after the government. And there would be other folks who were just trying their luck. So these are, you know, hacktivists who did it for a hobby and for the kick of it, right? Situation has changed today. People are doing it as a business. Uh, it's basically as much as it is uh, for you and me to go to find a job and work, go on vacation, earn a uh, provident fund or whatever it is other than a salary, go on, uh, you know, and, and come back and do your business and multiply and basically uh, rise up in the chain. It's just like that for the bad guys as well. It's a very well set up financially motivated organization of folks out there, right? So what we are looking at as the good internet is just about 25%. There is a deep dark web where these guys operate who basically sell contraband, people buy contraband, and there's a hell of a other things, uh, a lot of other things happening. Your credit cards get stolen. Where does that information get actually sold out to other folks who are interested? It's happening over the bad web, over the dark web, deep dark, dark web as it's called. We're not, we're not going to go into that. We don't have a hell of a lot of time for that. So one hand, we have financially motivated attackers. We also have folks who are motivated by nation states to go after one another. So you've heard a lot about that. China versus the US, uh, Russia versus the US influencing the US elections and so forth. All that can be done and all that is being done. And all that is being done over the internet, right? So influencing people over social networks, why you should actually not vote for uh, the woman, what's her name, uh, Clinton, or something like that, right? Or why should you actually vote for Trump and what's the benefit in that? So you actually swing the entire opinion of a voter. Now that can be done. Nothing, no, no, no big deal about it. So you have, on the one hand, take away from here, nation state at, uh, backed attackers, and then you have the financial, financially driven attackers. <coughs> What's the future of uh, cybersecurity? Is it, is it going to stop somewhere? 
this is the economics of it, right? This is why it will never stop, because for one, the attacker can never be caught, uh, because attribution is a problem. Uh, if, uh, if, let's say, Pakistan were to attack India, they, they don't have to do it from Karachi. They'll break into a local system in New Delhi, which is a zumbi, it's called a zumbi, and use the zumbi to attack Indian systems. So because of that, you can never attribute an attack. Uh, you cannot attack the attacker and deliver him a message. So you can't attack a Pakistani hacker and deliver Pakistan a message. It can't be done, right? So there's no retribution, there's no attribution. It's the cheapest way of doing things. Breaking into a bank, breaking into a government website, all you have to do is, you know, just bang on the keyboard and it'll happen. You have the right tools, it'll happen. Most of these attacks, are, most of the attacks that you see are not rocket science. They're just uh, taking advantage of badly administered networks that have loopholes in them. So that's basically what's happening here. What you see here, the curve at the bottom, and you guys must be very, very familiar with curves and uh, you know, getting tired of them, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. What you see there essentially is a typical military curve. So let's say one country needs to attack the other country. What you see is the cost of attack and the effect of the attack. If you have to declare war, let's say even terror, you want to commit to terror, you have to spend money. And war has, or kinetic war, it's called kinetic war when you go to war with another country. It requires a lot of uh, resources. You do have a huge impact coming out of that. As far as terror incidents are concerned, they're called asymmetric attacks. You still have to spend. To do a Bombay attack, you still have to spend money. It has asymmetric effects. That is, six guys can blow up an entire city. The most asymmetric is basically cyber. You don't spend anything at all. You can bring down the entire electrical system of a country as long as it's connected, right? So <coughs> this will go on because it doesn't cost you anything. The tools that it takes for you to do an attack or commit an attack essentially is about $1,000 or $1,500 or something like that. They are freely available. They are updated. Um, they are actually taken care of like a product, like any other software company does. Attackers are well connected, uh, well motivated, and essentially there's everything that's going for them. Right? So that's the situation, guys. That's the crux of cyber warfare. It'll always exist. You'll always have a job. This is the typical kill chain, as far as an atta attacker is concerned, right? Essentially, what he does is gains information about you from the social network, sends you a sucker email, so you become a sucker, and click something, a link on it. So. It just may say, you know, I'm the principal of GIS, I'm not very happy with you. Click on this to let me know, uh, you know, what you can do to help us improve your situation or whatever it is. I'm just giving, running an example. I don't know whether you guys like, the management likes me to do that, but I'm just giving you a sucker email, right? And you just go and click on that, uh, on that uh, link. Once you click on the link, you actually just trust it. It looks up like a very trusted, trustworthy email. But if you actually took time to see where the email is coming from, or the from, or the uh, link, you basically will see it's a, it's, a, it's a dumb link. It's basically a link that's coming from a source that's not a valid source. So you can figure it out. That's called a phishing email. You click on the link, it takes you somewhere, it downloads malware onto your machine. Your machine is not patched, maybe, because your administrator has gone to sleep, or he's slack or he doesn't know. It's not patched, and the malware downloads and installs itself on your machine. You're open, completely open. You're a zombie to be taken control of by a command and control server outside and basically carry out attacks against the local bank, against somebody's government, or whatever it is. You won't even know something's happening as long as you're powered on, right? So. Let's say, let's say the attack is, uh, is basically meant to be uh, using you against your own company. Let's say you're working in a company, the malware is injected itself, 
Once that happens, the command and control server basically allows you to do lateral movement. So it, the, the, the malware essentially connects to other systems that are connected to it and figures out you know, what is there on the network that it can actually make use of. Right? That's called lateral movement, after which all the data is extracted, that is critical data of your network, and then it's shipped out. Or your network can be brought down. So this is called, this is essentially called uh, ATP attack. Right? It can happen anytime. And the malware can change its behavior, you know, just about any time. So the attack can actually move in any, any direction as such. Therefore, the malware is massively distributed. If you've been attacked and made a zombie, there could be zombies across various networks who basically will take part in a massive attack against somebody else. That's called a botnet. You must have heard about a botnet. So this is the making of a botnet, right? There are many famous botnets out there like Nickers and uh, maybe others that uh, you must have heard of. So the command and control server essentially, the, the Zumbi connects to the command and control server. Command and control server says what you need to do for today. Okay. Now let's look at security. What do people might like, like me do? And uh, Atul wanted me to talk to you today because uh, from the point of view of uh, cyber as a career. So hopefully I have a show of hands maybe numbering two. Hopefully uh, by the time I step out of here uh, you have you have that multiplied five times at least so five people basically are interested to go for cyber, right? So this is how it used to be. Cyber used to be like that. Moats and castles, right? This is my network. This is my bank. I'm protecting it with a firewall. You must have heard that term firewall. It's more or less redundant now, right? So the attacker is outside. So like I showed you just now, the attacker is inside already. So it's moats and castles will not work any, any longer. What you need is security intelligence. What's happening on my network? What's anomalous? I showed you lateral movement a few slides back. Is somebody trying to probe various servers on my system? Is he shipping data out? Maybe you know, 15 gig of data at 10 o'clock at night, that's anomalous, that's anomalous behavior. So we have systems that basically correlate anomalous behaviors and raise them up as alerts. So that's what you see over here. So you have security systems that protect applications, that protect the network, endpoints such as your own desktops and mobiles. Um, you know, there is basically identity access management. You need to log in. When you log in, you need to have a credential to critical systems. And if there's information and data, uh, you basically need to have the right keys to access all that stuff, right? Any anomalous behavior from on across your access to these systems is actually picked up by security intelligence, right? Going forward, there's so much of information coming into the Security Intelligence Center, which is also called the Security Operations Center. I'm sure your school has one too, where a bunch of gearheads, security gearheads, are looking at a screen and seeing what are the alerts that are coming up and basically taking action, right? So much of information that needs to go in there. What are the new kinds of attacks? What are the new malware? What's the new malware that's attacking Southeast Asia? Uh, what are the new patterns of attack? Uh, what, are new, what are new blogs that have actually been written by security folks today uh, that has the right information and so forth? So that can't actually be digested by one man who's basically taken the job four year, you know, after four years of experience or something like that. You need a security specialist to man the center to actually keep you secure, which is what cognitive, uh, techniques will help you do, right? This is where machine learning and AI and cognitive come into the picture, right? So security needs to be an immune system, like I showed you earlier. These are all the points of security within your network that need to be protected. Everything needs to connect to the security intelligence system, which sits in 
Security Operations Center, right? What you see there as the cloud, the gray cloud there, is all these systems might be put in place, but without threat intelligence, that is information from the wild, you basically are helpless. So there was an IP address in the US from which a lot of spam mail essentially uh, originated, right? So there's an IP address to it. So that's basically IP reputation information that comes into your network, letting you know if a mail comes from that IP address, stop it, block it. So that's called threat intelligence, right? Okay, let's move on. And let's show you something. How does a security operations center run? And what does it look like? Are you seeing this on the firewall? All right, team. We have a threat that's just been validated. Can you throw up a Class C block on that firewall? We want to test something. Yep. Yeah, I see it too. Uh, how many machines are beaconing? Hold on, we're isolating the IP. Where's this even coming from? Well, as you said, Amy, they, they look to be the victim of a major data breach from a very sophisticated cybercrime group. It's hard to say if the hackers are still in the network. As of right now, we, we really don't know where the attack is coming from or who's behind it. Talk about the impact on the financial sector and Wall Street. But what about All right, everybody, let's go, let's go. It is out there. We need to make this a permanent block. So let's go, let's go. Where the hell have you been? I've got a report on one line, we have a reporter on the other. We need to get on it. I need some answers. We got 60 seconds. You ready to go? Honestly, guys, it doesn't get much worse. And for what we can see, it, it looks like they actually may change the ramifications from this are going to hit every industry. All right. Thanks for breaking this down today. Thank you. And you're on in three, two. We're dealing with a lot of uncertainty. Now, what I can tell you is that we've got a fantastic team that's working around the clock to resolve any issues that arise. And as soon as any information comes up, I'll be glad to give that to you in real time. So what did you actually see? What did you like about what you, what you saw? What did you notice? Anyone? Any connection between the stuff that I spoke and what you saw? Give me a show of hands, guys. If it's a new subject, you want to investigate, right? You want to draw connections. You saw a small clip. What was it of? Of a security operations center that I was talking to you about, right? This is life in a security operations center. 
uh, the clip was about a cyber attack, okay. yes, and th they were trying to like manage the tr threat because it already got out onto like the news. <laughs> That's the bad part. Yeah, once it gets to the news, people want to know why. You know why? Let's assume it's a bank that's bro bro been broken into, right? The central bank in every country requires the bank to actually make a disclosure saying that my customer's information has been hacked into, right? So it's a serious scenario. The bank's stocks will dip. Your information is out. The central bank requires the bank to actually write to you, paper, e paper mail, uh, the reputation of the bank drops, the stock drops, and a lot of things happen. So, so this is a real serious business that you see happening there. The media questioning the security manager, security operations center manager, which you saw towards the end, essentially just a manifestation. He's got to come back with an answer that's a solid answer, whatever it is. So this is essentially, guys, um, this is the reality. This is basically what security, the business of security is all about. Uh, you work on your systems, you run on a, on a network, uh, but there are so many other things that can happen in a work environment, uh, in, the, in the commercial environment, the government, or on the utility networks or whatever else, maybe even the defense networks. This is a situation, this is a nerve center where all the alerts essentially are monitored, anomalies are detected and acted upon. So you saw detect, analyze, respond. What was the respond word that you heard during this clip? Anybody? Do you remember? Do you remember the word isolate? Yeah. So an action needs to be taken to actually isolate the server or system that has the malware on it that's actually causing the attack. That's the action. So that's so that's the third part that's very important. Detection is important. The analysis is important for you to know whether it's a you know, really true attack or is it a false positive or false negative. If it's a false positive or false negative, you need to isolate, take that out of the picture because that's not really a real alert. And then finally, you need to respond to it and respond in real time. Things just happen like that, right? This shows you information from the wild. Take a note of that link down there. All of you can access this link. This is IBM's uh, threat intelligence research information out there, right? You can go to it right now. You can actually see the attacks as they're happening worldwide. And uh, you can see information such as this. You can do a search for stuff like WannaCry and how the attack essentially broke out. What happened? Have you heard of WannaCry, Petya? These are recent ransomware attacks, maybe not so re recent, but what else is happening on the internet? All the activities basically monitored, tracked here, and delivered to you, right? This is free. You can go access it. Now let's move to AI and machine learning and cognitive. How many of you guys are, have been interested in this area? I'm not talking about cyber, just AI, machine learning. All right, Red Hoodie, what do you think it is? What's your name? Uh, Siddhant, okay. Do you need a mic? Um, I, I think AI is not just about like how it's used in technology, it's like medicine, technology, business management. So I think AI is about how another person is helping someone so it's like it's got the human emotions and the intellect and it's sort of helping you to just get that information and get things done right yeah right. That's thank great. you are you interested in uh, a career in AI uh, not really but I'm <laughs> interested in like how it works sure so it's basically a machine right it needs to be t it's ne it needs to be taught to learn so you teach it to learn. You basically need, if you're teaching it security, it takes about two years for it to learn a security and to understand the terminology of security. 
a worm essentially is not a biological thing, it's basically a malware. So the, the system needs to be told that, right? The context of the word worm. Um, it's also fed right information, it's also fed wrong information. Once it's fed wrong information, the curator essentially advises the machine saying that, look, this is not what, what was meant, right? So both, both that is important. So this curation of data, feeding the data, drawing uh, you know, the context of data out, informing the machine, and slowly the machine starts learning, right? That's basically what it is all about. Then, when it sees an incident or an occurrence of uh, an alert or something like that, based on the context of the alert, it is able to give you expert information. Basically because it can ingest more information than a human being. That's basically all there is to it, right? Let's, let's take a look at cybersecurity and the information that's available, right? Every five minutes, that's the amount of information that's available. That's structured information. People like IBM, Symantec, all the vendors essentially supply, in Microsoft supply information about what patches are required, what are the vulnerabilities in their systems and so forth. That's structured information, right? Every hour, there are people, security specialists who are writing nonsense as well as good sense on their blogs, right? All this information needs to be uh, figured out, derived, so there could be basically an NSA administrator from the US, from the military, who's faced an attack, who basically writes about it that night, right? So that's basically that amount of churn of information that's happening every hour. Every week, papers need to be read. So somebody has published a paper in some university on security. So all this information needs to be ingested by a system so that at the end of it, it can actually assist a security manager when he has issues. So what is it actually doing here? What's the big difference between a security manager with one year's experience and 25 years experience? Is there a difference? It's called the sit experience. He's got experience being out there and having seen things, right? There is a big difference between doctors in Singapore and doctors in India. Why? There are more footfalls in the hospitals. They see more clinical situations. Over here, the response to I have a cold is basically here's a tablet. Over there, it's more investigative. Of course, there are some things that, that are good about medicine over here, that are good about medicine in India, and that are bad about medicine in India, such as aftercare, it's poor, right? So we have diagnosis, which is an important thing, which is richer there, basically because of better tacit experience. Here, out of an AI system, you're actually building a lot of tacit experience and delivering tacit experience to a young guy who's a rookie who's actually on the spot to provide the care uh, to be able to do that. So this applies to security, this applies to oncology, this applies to anything else, right? Let's, let's take a look at what cognitive security essentially means. So I'll leave you with this. Essentially, as far as security is concerned, whether it's cybersecurity or it's, uh, it's basically security as in terms of, uh, you know, the defense forces, it's important for you to know your forces and your situation and know the enemy to actually be secure, right? Fundamentally, that's what's important here. So before a cyber attack, you need to know all your vulnerabilities on your network. You also need to know what someone else is doing. If you saw, if you remember the clip that you saw just now, the whole big question was, am I being attacked? What is happening? You've got to make sense of whatever is happening and basically uh, map it to the situation out there. So what is the attacker going after? Where, 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 will, where will this basically uh, end up? What will be brought down? What will be stolen and so forth? So that's essentially fundamentally important for you to know your own domain and then essentially to know what the guy, bad guy essentially is doing.
So I'll just leave you with this thought and uh, maybe then I can uh, submit myself to your questioning. Thank, thank you guys. Thank you, sir, for that extremely informative and revealing uh, presentation. Now, over to Shivani for the first question. Uh, sir, so after your presentation, we can't help but be curious about your early years and your inspiration to take up cybersecurity as a career. So could you please share a few stories from your early career? And what was it that inspired you to take it up? Well, I just drifted into it. Um, I was trained as a hardware engineer, so essentially digital systems. I actually taught here in Singapore for a couple of years, um, and I set up the course for one of the institutions. And uh, I essentially joined Hewlett Packard, and uh, we st started building you know, banking systems. Banking essentially came online around that time. 1996 or so, so forth. Stock exchanges became electronic, so new policies need to be needed to be written uh, for them. And then payments and stuff like that became electronic too, that needed to be secured. So slowly I, you know, I was drawn into uh, security and then of course into this situation today. Uh, thank you, sir. The next question is from my colleague Arush. So over to you, Arush. Sir, as the youth of today who will step into the leadership roles of tomorrow, we really need to keep in pace with the technological advancements of the age. Uh, and uh, a student in our sister campus in Indore has an interesting question about this. He asks, our, his school regularly holds coding and robotics boot camps for students right from their primary years. And he asks your opinion on this. And how far do you think this is beneficial for the challenges students will face in the 21st century? No, he's asking how uh, beneficial would coding and robotics boot camps be for challenges uh, that students face in the 21st century. You mean to say hackathons? Yeah, things like that. Coding is, uh, you know, fundamentally important. You need to uh, know to code and you need to be, uh, you know, sort of excited by it, right? Uh, what do a few lines of code essentially do? The skills of coding are important. Uh, because that's how the bad guys work, right? They are expert coders. So if you want to do something in cybersecurity, certainly, you know, you should actually know uh, coding and be interested uh, initially. You can't jump into it and, uh, you know, basically learn coding as such. But I've actually advised quite a few schools and quite a few um, uh, aspirants to... Um, have you guys seen or heard of this uh, Lego uh, sci you know, Lego robotics kit? Mindstorm? Yeah, that's a good starting point. You, you essentially you write a few lines of code, you do a delay subroutine, you see, see things happening out there. Otherwise, you know, it's quite, quite an abstract situation. Why should I be kicked with a, you know, with a, with a particular delay loop or something else? What's exactly happening? What's the effect of it? And you don't see the effect until you have actually written accurate code, and you remove the bugs and so forth, right? So it is quite an abstract thing. But when you do it with something like Mindstorm, start with that, you see things physically happening. You move that, that robot from this point to that point, or whatever it is, it's worth it for you to do it, if you're interested. Thank you. Sorry. Um, sir? We actually have a robot on our smart campus premises, and it's programmed to carry books and basic admin functions. And eventually, it will become smarter using machine learning and AI. But the question that we have here is, how do you think all these advances in technology will affect the job market, sir? Well, I mean, this is an oft-asked question. Essentially, it's not going to affect the job market adversely. Jobs are not going to go. Job, essentially, jobs are going to change, right? 
um, as to whether you know the volumes of opportunities will be the same is an open question. But the the, the way in which uh, you know um, professions will change uh, is actually good. You're actually m moving into a high value job. Uh, you know when you actually go with a situation like that. And it's inevitable, right? It's going to happen, certainly going to happen. Uh, there are a lot of lawyers who do simple, you know, cross-referencing. Their jobs are going to go. You know, fundamentally, there is no, you know, productivity out of that. It can be done by a machine. Perhaps they should move into, uh, they will move into a different kind of a role where the legal decision has to be made based on... Uh, ethical situations or something else, which is very human from a decision standpoint, right? Correlation is something that can be, you know, you just correlate and, and fight a case and win it and you, you know, uh, charge a fat fee. Uh, perhaps those things will be gone, which is goodness. Thank uh, you, sir. It is said that our generation, Gen Z, was born with a device in each hand. Some of our, ch some children these days actually learn to be smartphone savvy even before they learn their own mother tongues. So in such a situation, as an expert in the field of cybersecurity, what is your advice for the safe and responsible use of such devices to our students? Interesting. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Don't spend too much time on devices. That would be my, my advice. Uh, do it, essentially use devices for the, for the function of it, right? Um, I, would, I would think too much overuse of it, basically, uh, is also not good. I mean, uh, I would say, see, see, take Steve Jobs' as example. You know, he didn't let his kids touch, uh, you know, uh, any of these devices at home. He, he flogged it at all of us and he's having a good, I mean, perhaps having a good time in the happy hunting grounds where he is. But, uh, and, and, you know, Apple is having a huge uh, stock value, but uh, I would think from uh, the point of view of silencing a child, a crying child, people hand the kid uh, a phone or a device, uh, that's not the way to go. Uh, it's very important for you to balance uh, interactions with uh, with your people, with people, with your parents, uh, grandparents, and so forth, which is which is basically fundamentally important for you to uh, for your growth as a human being. Uh, use your devices for specific you know, purposes. If you socialize, over socialize on devices, you're living in a in a false world. And there's a there's a lot of false identities on the social networks through false identities. Uh, you know, a lot of cyber attackers essentially uh, uh, take advantage of you. Thank yeah, you, so, sir. So in my view, just limit it. Uh, it's, it's much better for you to play a game of tennis, get a hit out there, sweat it out. So, sir, a major concern that people nowadays have with the use of internet is the loss of privacy. So as a cybersecurity expert, how do you balance cyber security with an individual's right to privacy? Depends on how you use it, right? I mean, one, one aspect is uh, credential theft that happens. People, hackers steal your credentials and then um, create uh, an identity of yourself on the web and, uh, you know, and proceed from there. That's where the balance is important. One is bas basically uh, following safe practices on sh social networks. That's fundamentally important. What are you giving away as information? That's also important. And uh, that's where the balance between uh, you know, your physical interaction as well as your, uh, what should I say, your interaction uh, on the social networks is, uh, is, a, is an important aspect, right? Um, it's not just uh, credential theft, it's basically also your own view of yourself and your identity that, that undergoes a tremendous shift that you need to be careful about. So the, the, the social network should not be actually milking you. Uh, you should be milking it. Did I answer your question? Yeah, maybe both of us are hungry. <laughs> 
Sir, as you already mentioned, uh, credentials are being stolen and banking has gone online. And you must have experienced and tackled so many problems. Which one is the most challenging assignment that you've faced till date and how have you dealt with it? Talking about essentially customers or talking about uh, solutions? Well, um, I would think the most uh, challenging scenario is to advise governments about uh, how to set up their cybersecurity infrastructure. You know, from a from a professional's perspective, because there are a lot of uh, a lot of forces, a lot of issues, uh, you know, at work there. Um, so, for example, uh, it's. When it comes to a country protecting itself, it needs to have a federal or central security operations center. There are a lot of ambitions, a lot of you know hats in the ring, lots of uh, different organizations who want to aspire for that role without knowing what they have to do actually to uh, set it up and run it efficiently. There is an issue of uh, capacity that this you don't have enough people to man those security operation centers. And then how is that entirely going to be funded? How is it going to be supported? Uh, how is the planning going to be done for that uh, going forward? So I've seen a lot of um, cycles being spent in uh, defining the solution, selling the solution, and uh, the entire thing going sideways essentially because someone, for smaller reasons, right? So that has been uh, my, you know, toughest experience to, to uh, advise a bank about how to secure itself for a smaller organization, it's much easier. As a mark of appreciation for visiting the GIIS Smart Campus, I request Mr. Rajiv Katyal, Deputy CEO of Global Schools Foundation, to present Mr. Krishnan Jagannathan with a token of thanks. Seeing that at this point the panel members may have a few remaining questions, but we request them to curtail their curiosity for later. So uh, moving on to the vote of thanks, on behalf of Global Schools Foundation and the network of Global Indian International Schools, I take the privilege of proposing the vote of thanks. We sincerely thank you, Mr. Krishnan Jagannathan, for taking time off your busy schedule and agreeing to share your global perspective on cybersecurity. We would also like to thank our audience here at the GIIS Smart Campus Bungol, as well as our counterparts in Abu Dhabi, Japan, Malaysia, as well as India for joining us for this extremely relevant and interesting lecture. We are grateful to the executive management for their support and all the members of staff and students for being such a wonderful audience. We request all students to remain seated until further instructions. Thank you and have a great day ahead. Thank you guys. Thanks for your uh, attention and being here. Wonderful audience. Thank you. I'll uh, leave my email uh, with, uh, with uh, Atul uh, if, uh, if you have essentially have questions after the session. Uh, don't hesitate dropping an email. Okay. Any one of you? There is certainly, there has certainly been, but uh, it's like fusion, right? How much goes into it and what you get out of it. It's that balance that needs to be struck, and uh, that's what we're waiting for. Oh, sure, sure. More uh, powerful quantum machines being built, so yeah, stringing them all of them together perhaps will uh, get you there. <laughs> Thanks.